Good afternoon and welcome to our special meeting, our City Council Budget Workshop meeting of May 31st, 2022. I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask our clerk to please read the roll. Vice Mayor Hattischel? Here. Council Member Alvord? Here. Council Member Ricucci? Here. Council Member Mendonca? Here. And Mayor Bernasconi? Here. Thank you. I'd like to ask Council Member Mendonca if he would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we will get started here. We have a big meeting this afternoon really our guidebook for the city. I will turn it over to our city manager to start us off. Thank you, Mayor Bersconi and members of the city do council. We do uh, um, public comment on public comment? agenda items? Oh. Is that what you were going to say? Yes. Okay. okay. Put me down. I was going to say that attorney. too. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there anyone here who would like to make a, item, make a comment on any item that's on the agenda for under public comment? If it's not on, it's not on the tonight's it's on agenda. Because it's on the agenda. Here. We're going to take public comment. Did you want to make a public comment? It's not on the agenda. It's not on the agenda. It's not, not on the not agenda. On the agenda. Yes. Okay, oh. go for it. Hi, Nick. Calm down. Okay. Hello, my name is Nick Bryant. Um, we have been uh, finding graffiti on our bus shelters, and not only that, I had to report this to the city. Well, one day I found it on the Roseville Electric, Electric Utility Box, and I had called Roseville Electric, reported it, and they came out and cleaned it up right away. And what we think it's kids that are doing graffiti, and not only that, they're doing it to our bus shelters, and we need to start cracking down on graffiti because if it's kids that are doing it, it needs to stop immediately. Thank you. Comments, Mr. Bryant? Thank Thanks you. for reporting it. No. Thank you. Is there anyone else here this evening that would like to make a public comment? Okay, I'll close public comment and now I'll turn it over to our city manager. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as, as you'd mentioned, we have an action-packed agenda tonight. So uh, I will roll into it with the presentation as soon as it uh, comes up. Okay, so uh, with the workshop and the agenda overview, uh, we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and do a full overview of of the budget, the budget process. Uh, in addition to that, though, we'll talk a little bit about our fiscal uh, realities, uh, not only our current but our future fiscal uh, environment with our five year forecast. And then each department. Uh, and let me back up. So some of our smaller internal service departments, uh, Dennis and Scott will be taking care of uh, reporting out on those. But a lot of our outward facing and larger operational departments. Each department is here this evening, and we'll be doing a report out. I was gonna do so that. it'll be in the order that you see here: uh, police, fire, parks, recreation, libraries, development services, public works, economic development, and then we'll have a short closing because I will pretty much guarantee you those will take us almost up to the end. Uh, and, and this is for the council, but also the, the public. After each section, we will have a break for public comments. So that way we found that way it breaks it up kind of nicely. Uh, that way you have the information's fresh and you're able to, to ask questions relevant to that portion of the budget. And then next, as you can see, we talk about this often, we joke about uh, we start the new budget process as soon as the old one is, is adopted. And as you can see from the presentation here tonight, that's pretty accurate. Uh, we started back in, in February with the budget development calendar, uh, looking at, at all of our, our uh, pension debt and other post-retirement benefits and liability and bringing that bringing that to the council. And then February, we had our council goals workshop where we reestablished our council goals of maintaining a safe and healthy community, remaining fiscally responsible in the changing world, the economic vitality, uh, making sure that we're investing in, in well-planned infrastructure, supporting our community engagement and advocacy, and then also wrapping it all together with developing 
uh, delivering exceptional services. And one of the things I would say is uh, this planning process actually started back in 2019, and this, this was an update of that, that strategic workshop and plan. Uh, and and I'm, I'm very happy to, to report tonight, you'll see in not only the overview, but in the department presentations, really the wherewithal of the city council and staff to hold true to those policies and really deliver on these city council goals and making sure that, that all of them go to aiming to make sure we're really preserving the quality of life, not only but now, but in the future as, as we grow. And obviously it aligns with the council goals and, and work. And I did provide some of the council uh, goal uh, plan updates on the on the staff table if if any anyone in attendance is is offering those are uh, available at at city hall also for those of the watching that would like a copy uh, and then on 20 the march 28th through th uh, 31st every department goes through city manager budget reviews uh, where we not only talk about current expenses but future expenses and we go over our, our current themes and, and challenges and and what went into developing each department's budget uh, and that includes not only fleet and vehicle replacement, but new personnel and, and also looking at as, as staffing needs change, right? What today may have been a technician is, is today somebody, maybe it's a software analyst because the job has changed. Uh, and so we look at that and you'll see that there is a position request that will be with this budget, uh, which Dennis will, will go over and each of the departments will go over. And, and so we look forward to that. I won't go into too much detail because I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, uh, April 20th, we brought forward the utilities budget preview where both the electric utility and the water utility, utility wastewater utility, uh, and solid waste utility all shared their, their financial updates and, and their fiscal forecasts. Uh, we also brought forward the Measure B, Local Sales Tax Oversight Committee, to ensure uh, not only is, is the general fund we, we currently use supporting those quality of life services, but specifically the Measure B half-cent sales tax is going towards uh, what we said it would go to. And, and you'll see tonight largely uh, a lot of the new funding and additional funding is going to support public safety and the quality of life services that we heard uh, were so important to our, our community uh, as well as our, our city council. May 4th, we had the Capital Improvement Project, where we re reviewed a very ambitious and robust capital improvement plan, uh, which will carry over the next year. Uh, and then today, or, or I'm sorry, on May 18th, we had the financial policies, all the policies that will change. One uh, in particular that went with the capital improvement was reinvesting more in our capital improvement to make sure as our infrastructure, in, infrastructure ages, uh, we don't have failures, we don't have closures, and we, we don't have power outages, and, and, and ensuring that all of our, our utilities are working uh, and all of our facilities are safe and, and up to date. And I think... As we go to the next slide, that will bring us current, where uh, May 20, we sent out the budgets to, to City Council. Uh, we also released them to a lot of our partners, which I'll, I'll share in the outreach piece as well. Uh, brings us to today, which is our budget workshop, where we'll go over our budget presentations. We'll talk about fiscal trends uh, and talk about each of our, our department operating budgets that I, I shared earlier on an earlier slide. And then uh, per our charter, we have to have an approved budget by, by July 1. Uh, and so we'll be bringing it to the next council meeting on June 15th for the council to consider the approval of the budget. But as you can see, this is certainly not a one meeting or one person job. It really, really takes a village. There was a lot of people working on this over, over the last year. And, and so uh, I share these slides just to share not only with the council, but with the community. It, it is a very long, extensive, and transparent process. And with the outreach, as I share, we, we created a budget of brief, which is also uh, at the staff table. And really what this is, is, is it, takes, it, ta <laughs> it takes a huge budget document and brings it down to a trifold, really kind of sharing w w what revenues are coming in, what expenses are going out, what are the major categories of service, and, and where do we spend the general taxpayer dollars for those services. And it, it's a very good short summary uh, of what this much longer budget document makes up. Uh, we share those, share those on our website, share it through our e-newsletter. Uh, all of our social media platforms have a copy of our budget and our budget brief. We also share it with our neighborhood associations who we find to be a great outreach uh, for partners within the neighbors uh, of all of our communities. 
uh, share it with our Sun City Roseville since we're very engaged with them, uh, not only from, from working with them in their neighborhood groups, but also with their legislative advocacy groups. Uh, so it's important they understand where, where the budget is and, and it's going, obviously with the Chamber of Commerce and then all of our employees as well. And, and so we make sure that the awareness and outreach is, is extensive and also diverse. So we're hitting very, very different groups uh, to get as many people as informed as we possibly can. And the purpose for tonight is really to share those revenues and those expenses. And then where are our revenues coming? So where, where, where is the revenue coming in? What do we use it for? Is where is it going out? And staffing is always a big part of the discussion because we're, we're in the people business. Uh, we don't make widgets. We don't make things. We provide services. And, and it takes people to do that. And, and so you'll see that, that that's a lot of our budget is dedicated to staffing to provide those services that our, our community desires and, and expects at, at a high level. And then we'll drill down a little further into the general fund, talking about specifically which revenues and expenditures are, are spent on, on police, on fire, on parks, on libraries, and really drilling it down to, to share, share where those dollars are going, particularly talking about some of the Measure B priorities we heard, uh, and making sure that not only are, are we sharing that with, through our Measure B scorecard, uh, but that we're also sharing with the council and the community to ensure that we're keeping our commitments on what we said we would do with that half-cent sales tax. Um, we'll share those, those a little bit later. Uh, also talking about some of the challenges. You guys have heard, uh, you know, this is, is, is a, we are very, very fiscally positive, and, and we're certainly seeing a strength, but, but times are uncertain. There's a lot of disruption in the market, a lot of inflation, supply chain disruption, talent loss. Uh, and, and so we certainly want to talk about those and because and, really one of the best things you can do to, to meet challenges is anticipate them, a plan for them, and then communicate about them to not only the council but as an organization and the community so we can work together to, to mitigate them. Uh, we'll talk about the five-year forecast. Dennis will share that, what we see happening over the next five years from, from a revenue and expense uh, so we can plan and begin to not only look at where we have capacity today, but how it can help us in, into the future. And, and certainly there's a lot of that in this budget. Uh, and then we'll also do the operation uh, for each of the departments to give you a summary of their overall operational budget. Uh, and I think the, the thing that, that I'd like you to take away from, from this is, is really making sure that this budget in several areas key focuses on, on the council priorities and the community priorities we saw through not only Engage Roseville, but we continue to see in our Measure B meetings. And that's maintaining our service levels as we grow. Uh, people believe, and, and I believe, uh, that we have a very high quality of life and, and a very exceptional service level. And, and though, but as we grow, how do we maintain that? And, and this budget certainly talks about that and, and does that. Uh, and addressing new and state federal mandates. We've talked a, little about, a lot about that in the utilities, uh, sp particularly with uh, Senate Bill 1383 revolving around organics. Uh, but, but there are new costs and new staffing needs that are going to be added as a result of, of federal mandates and, and regulations. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and ensuring that we're able to enhance service levels in those areas we, we've shown desire, whether it be in a citywide park, whether it be an expansion of a police beat, uh, being more proactive about graffiti, as, as we heard in the public comment. Uh, we're certainly putting some to, to deal with that and enhancing our, our ability to not only uh, report it and track it, but respond faster and be able to track it in a way that we track other, other issues that are important to us uh, through, through real-time crime. Uh, and then lastly on here is maintaining our reserves, making sure that, that we're not making uh, permanent cuts for what, what is really a short-term problem. And, and that's really the, the, the nexus to the making sure we have a strong reserve. We're paying down our obligations uh, because a lot of those are, are short-term problems. And unfortunately, through the Great Recession, a lot of cities, including us, uh, had to stop paying down on unfunded liabilities and stop paying in areas that, that were, were important, like capital improvement. Uh, and what we want to do is not make that mistake again. We recognize there's most likely a market correction coming, and we, we want to do everything we can to be fiscally prepared for that. Uh, and this budget certainly moves us down the road on that uh, very significantly, maybe more so than the last two. Uh, going, again, making sure that we have the capacity as we grow to we to preserve our service levels. Uh, and, and so Dennis goes in a lot of great length on that, and, and Scott, so I won't, won't go into too much more detail on that, but that's a really big part of this budget. 
And going back to the, the, the measure B, I think specifically I did want to call some of these out because they were so important. Uh, fully, fully staffing the police beat in, in West Roseville uh, was a commitment that was made. We, we staffed it pretty much halfway, which was was uh, four or five police officers. Well, now we're adding the additional four or five police officers to make sure that beat is, is fully expanded. But we're also adding additional public safety, uh, not only to make sure some of our traffic concerns are addressed, but in our, our real-time uh, crime center and monitoring crime real-time. And, and we've seen a lot of success in some of our flock camera and being able to track uh, perpetrators as, as they're escaping or fleeing the city and, and have seen a lot of success in that. And so we want that message sent that, that if you come in Roseville to do crime, uh, we're not going to let it go. We're, we're, we're going to, if it means going to Sacramento, it means going to, to San Jose, even in some cases, we'll do that. We, we want to make sure that this stays a, a safe and healthy community and, and certainly making sure our public safety staffing levels are, are not only adequate, but ideal for providing that is something that I know is a priority of this city council and a priority of this community. And again, this budget reflects that. Uh, and, and service levels in our citywide parks. You know, what we continually hear is, is the love and the affinity for our, our trail system and our park system. And I think a big reason of that is because it's so well preserved and maintained, and we have to protect that. And, and one way we do that is to ensure we have the maintenance dollars once we build the parks to maintain them. Uh, and, and so we allow for that. We allowed for some of the additional maintenance in Harry Crab as we finished Harry Crab Park and also for Central Park as we finished Central Park. And we have our eye now on, on another citywide park out west, uh, which will be be our our next large citywide park, which will require uh, staff and maintenance dollars to maintain. And so we start to begin to plan to prepare for that development uh, as part of this budget process. And, and again, a, a large part of it was fiscal health and making sure that we're fiscally responsible. Uh, and, and of the last uh, two, two years, we've made significant headway on building and maintaining a, an economic stabilization in the general fund uh, and our emergency reserve to make sure we can weather the, those storms. We've paid down uh, our, our early uh, our health liabilities and pay down Cal, CalPERS pension debt early. And, and as we've talked about in the past, what that really does is it gives us capacity today. So if we're taking those dollars and we're paying down on bills that we're paying interest and we continue to pay on, well, making those one-time payments creates additional capacity in the budget moving forward. And so we want to make sure that, that we continue to do that. And again, it allows us to make sure we can provide those, fu those future services. As, as you'll see in the five-year forecast, our expense continue to grow and continue to outpace revenues and so we need to use every tool at our, our disposal to ensure we're creating as much capacity as we can moving forward. And so in, in summary our, our fiscal responsibility is, is we're aligning our mission with the council's strategic goals. This budget lives within our means. Uh, we, are, we are providing not only core services, but additional expanded services that we discussed uh, on police and, and, and with graffiti and, and in some of our, our park programs uh, to ensure those services remain strong. Uh, as I shared, the concerns on, an, uh, on impacts of inflation and rate hikes, supply chain disruption, uh, the, these all remain concerns. And, and again, uh, I don't think we need to be afraid of them, but we need to be aware of them and we need to plan for them. And some of that will be mean growing our, our, our ability to store materials uh, so we have more materials on hand. And it'll also mean planning for larger costs and ensuring that we're putting that in our structure and our planning. Uh, in, in, as we move forward and, and we look at revenues and expenses, uh, one of the concerns is there still is, is uh, we're still challenged for long-term growth as, as we look at revenues and expenses. And so we're going to continue to look at ways to be more effective, more efficient, and continues to look for new revenue sources to ensure that our, our revenues uh, keep up with our expenses in, into the future. And also the, the limited resources for, for new capital projects ensuring that, that we're able to not only build new capital projects, but maintain the things we have today. And balancing that is certainly a, a concern as we go forward. Again, not something that, that we're, we're fearful of, just something we need to be aware of and, and plan for. Uh, and then our Measure B priorities, maintaining current priority service levels was very, very important. Uh, and, and certainly this budget reflects that. The focus on high priority new service levels, as we mentioned with the police, uh, we also mentioned with graffiti and abatement, and, and so both of those are, are in this budget as well, and the real-time crime center. 
and then the, the stabilization uh, reserve it, continue to to pay that down and make sure that, that we have that general fund stabilization uh, provided we do hit hit a loss or a sharp loss, I should say, in revenues from, from sales tax as a result of a recession. And what that will do is that will help us really smooth out any, any service levels that would need to, be, need to be done. And we do share a potential uh, impact from a recession in our, in our five-year plan later, later in the presentation. Uh, and then making sure that we're paying down our long-term liabilities to continue to build capacity. And, and really, that's a strategy we identified a few years back, where if we pay some of the, the public employee retirement system payments sooner, uh, while it may be a little more money up front, over time, the return is, is in, in, in some cases in the millions, but routinely in the hundreds of thousands. And that's ongoing money, right, that we use for police, fires, parks, and libraries that we're able to keep capacity in, in the general fund budget. And it's been a strategy that served us well the last, last few years, uh, and it's one we see into the future continuing to serve us well. So that was a lot, and it was, it was pretty quick. Uh, because you're going to hear a lot more about it from, from Dennis Scott and the department heads. But I did want to give you a quick overview and give you an opportunity to break for any questions before we get started. Thank you. Does Council have any questions for Dom? This okay. one. Um, in this document, you mentioned that you know public participation in the budget process is essential to establishing city budget priorities. So by January, I mean January, June 9th, um, you know, the public, any public comments should be should be sent in so that it can be considered at our 15th meeting. Is that roughly? I mean, yes. Yes. And, there, and there's been been off ramps along the way to take in public comment and presentations when we, we've went to, to different social clubs, went to Sun City and, and Arcona. So certainly we've talked about about the budget and some of the, the priorities. Uh, and, and certainly the, the council goals workshop was a great spot to yeah, give input into policy. I mean, this is a foundational document that guides the whole the city operations and <laughs> services for the fiscal year. So charts the course. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So before we hear from two members of our financial team, I'd like for our clerk to just read through some of the uh, procedures for this evening. Right. If I could just back up for a second and just let anyone know that if you need an agenda, they are available at the end of the staff table. And as uh, city manager Casey had indicated, after each department presentation, there will be an opportunity for public comment. Each speaker will be uh, provided five minutes to make their comments. And the speakers, uh, the comment time will be monitored by the monitor at the podium. And when you see the red light flash, that means you have to conclude your comments. And just as a reminder that no formal action will be taken here today, uh, the, the budget will be formally considered at the council meeting of, of June 15th. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll start with you both. Good afternoon, Mayor Bernasconi and council members. I'm Dennis Kaufman, Assistant City Manager and Chief Financial Officer. And presenting with me today is Scott Pettengill, the City's Budget Manager. On the next slide, Scott will uh, present information about the proposed citywide budget, uh, including a snapshot of the five-year capital improvement program. And then he'll move into the general fund uh, revenue and expenditure budgets. And then I'll take over and present a little bit more information about the general fund expenditures and I will talk about how this proposed budget uh, helps the city plan for the future. And then I'll pro provide information on the updated general fund five-year forecast. And finally, I'll present a summary of the general government uh, departments uh, before you hear from each of the operating departments about their proposed budgets. And before I turn it over to Scott, I'd like to thank him and the city's incredible budget team uh, for their efforts in putting together this proposed budget and their professionalism in publishing this 500 plus page uh, budget book that's really, uh, it captures the city's policy goals and priorities. And it's in a format that's worthy of recognition from our national and state government finance associations uh, for excellence in budget presentation. So I'd just like to uh, recognize them at this point and I will turn the presentation over to Scott. Thank you, Dennis. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, Scott Pettengill, your budget manager. And as Dennis mentioned, I'll begin with an overview of our citywide budget and our revenues. The total citywide budget is $788 million, and this pie chart provides an overview of the funds that make up that $788 million. 
Similar to prior years, the enterprise funds, including electric, EU, transit, make up a majority of our revenues at 56% or $443 million. The next largest source of revenue is the general fund, which makes up 28% of all revenues or $218 million. The balance of the revenues are reflected in the other funds category and include special districts, development fees, and golf fees. Other funds make up about 16% of all city revenues at $127 million. I'll next move on to citywide expenditures. Citywide expenditure budget totals $767 million. The proportional share of each of the major spending categories included in the budget are similar to prior years. Salaries, wages, and benefits, and material service supplies make up a majority of our spending plan. Salary, wages, and benefits make up 35% of our budget at $272 million. And the next lar largest spending category is material service supplies at 31% or $239 million. 16% or $119 million of the proposed budget is dedicated for capital projects, and 10% or $75 million will be spent on electric purchase power and supply. The remaining 8% of our spending plan, as indicated in the other category, includes spending for debt service and transfers to other funds. Next, I'll cover citywide staffing levels. Total citywide staffing in the proposed budget includes 43 additional positions from 1,277 positions to 1,320 positions. Overall, this represents a 3% increase in staffing citywide. This chart provides a summary of the position increases by department. Increases in development services, fire, parks, recreation, libraries, police, and, um, and public works will be discussed in their individual presentations. Electric and EU provide an overview of, provided an overview of their position increases at their prior presentations. The increase in the city attorney's office is for a new deputy city attorney position. This position will provide legal services for civil and criminal matters, advise departments and city boards, assist with litigation matters, and this position will also serve as the city's first prosecutor. The two positions in the finance department include an accountant and a buyer. Both these positions are currently limited term and the proposed budget recommends that these positions be converted to regular full-time positions to address our ongoing workload needs. The four additional positions in IT include an IT analyst, a business systems analyst, and two database analysts. These positions will assist with data intelligence, the open data project, the customer relationship management system, and security citywide. This next slide summarizes the recommended position increases by city council goal and also identifies the position's growth related, enhances service levels, or is required because of state and federal mandates. Of the 43 positions that are included in the budget, 19 support the goal of maintaining a safe and healthy community. 13.5 support the goal of delivery of exceptional city services. 8.5 support the goal of investing in well-planned infrastructure and growth. And lastly, the two positions support goal, the goal of remaining fiscally responsible in a changing world. A majority of the positions in the proposed budget are required to maintain services in the growing city, followed by enhanced service levels and state and federal mandates. Next, I'll provide a brief overview of our capital improvement program included in the budget. The proposed budget includes $105 million of capital project appropriations, with the majority of the projects in our parks, recreation, libraries, and utility departments. An overview of the proposed projects was included um, in a prior presentation on May 6th. Staff have also incorporated the department's long-term capital planning in the five-year capital improvement program, which is also included in the budget book. This, this five-year program almost totals $400 million in capital spending anticipated for the next five years. I'll now move on to the general fund. General fund revenue budget is based on primary assumption that tax revenues will continue to grow next year, but just not at the same pace as they have in the past year. The three largest revenue sources in the general fund are Bradley Burns sales tax, the Measure B local sales tax, and property tax. Bradley Burns is projected to grow more than 13% in the current year, and their proposed budget assumes modest growth to $74 million, which is midway between our, tax, our city tax consultants' conservative and most likely projections. Measure B revenue is projected to grow by almost 15% in the current year, and the proposed budget estimate is $28 million, which is again midway between our tax consultant conservative and most likely projections. Property tax revenue is estimated to grow by $5.9 million or $64.4 million in the next year. 
And I also wanted to note that a portion of our property tax revenue growth is returned to the county under the city's tax sharing agreements. The total city fund operating revenue budget is almost $212 million. This pie chart shows the general fund revenue contributions from each source, with the Bradley Burn sales tax, Measure B sales tax, and property tax re making up a majority of our general fund revenues at 80%. The remaining 20% is made up of licenses and permits, the electric franchise fee, and charges for service and other taxes. This next slide provides an overview of our Bradley Burns sales tax by category. And this information is based on our 22 actuals received to date. Sales tax received from general retail, including the Roseville Galleria, transportation related purchases, including at the Roseville Auto Mall and gas stations, make up a majority of our sales tax revenue at 73%. The remaining revenue comes from food products, business to business activity, and construction activity. This graph provides a multi-year comparison of sales tax, including the collection of Measure B beginning in fiscal year 19. As stated earlier, the proposed budget includes approximately 76 million in Bradley Burns revenues and 28 million in Measure B, or 140, 104 million in total. This next graph shows our 10-year history of city property tax and the amount budgeted for fiscal year 23 at 64 million. The city has experienced a relatively consistent growth rate in property tax revenue due to growth in the city and rising property values. Building permits were on the rise for single family residences as new development continues to bring in more property tax revenues. And I'll conclude with an overview of our general fund expenditures. General fund expenditures in our operating budget total $212 million. Almost half of the operating budget is dedicated towards public safety services. The police department makes up 26% of the budget at $55 million, and the fire department makes up 20% of our budget at $42 million. The Parks, Recreation, and Libraries Department makes up 15% of the general fund at $31 million, and the balance of the funding is dedicated towards general government departments, which Dennis will go into more detail a little bit later as well as the Development Services and Public Safety, sorry, Public Works Department. The other category includes items such as transfers to other funds and the CalPERS additionally discretionary payment, which Dennis will also go uh, in a bit, into more detail a little bit later. So this concludes my portion of the presentation, and I'll turn it back to Dennis. Thanks, Scott. So when we look at general fund expenditures, uh, we look at them through a variety of different lenses. Um, by department is one perspective that you saw on that dollar bill graph. Another perspective is kind of the nature of the different expenditures. Um, Scott mentioned earlier that the citywide expense budget is made up of about one third of labor costs. But in the general fund, it's actually closer to two thirds of the general fund expenditure budget that's labor costs. Because as our city manager mentioned, city employees perform and deliver the services uh, uh, to the community. Um, so that's one perspective. Another perspective on general fund expenditures is determining how much is discretionary spending of the city's major tax revenues in the general fund. And so we go through this exercise uh, at looking at our general fund expenditures. And some of our general fund expenditures are financed by revenues that are collected for providing specific services. And some revenues in the general fund are directly restricted to specific services. So for example, in charges for services, our Parks, Recreation, and Libraries Department or our Development Services Department collects revenues that are specifically tied to uh, services that they provide. Our electric franchise fee, uh, according to the city charter, is intended for police, fire, and parks, recreation, and libraries. And our licenses and permits are specifically tied to services that are provided by certain departments. So it's important to note that about $39 million of our expenditures in the general fund are tied to related revenues. And then we have some general fund expenditures that are contractual obligations, like the tax sharing uh, payments that Scott mentioned. Uh, or there are expenditures in the general fund that are tied to council policies that, that the council has adopted. And those total about $22 million. Those annexation tax sharing payments are one example. Our retiree benefit payments, those OPEB payments that we make pursuant to our OPEB funding policy are another example. So those uh, contractual or, or kind of non-discretionary payments it's total about $22 million. 
So on this next graphic, we tried to show this graphically, um, showing the total operating budget at the top of $212 million, subtracting off those revenue offset expenditures of $39 million, subtracting off those non-discretionary expenditures of $22 million, brings us down to about $151 million of discretionary spending in the general fund. Of that, the general fund budget has about $77 million for police and fire, public safety. So more than half of the truly discretionary dollars in the expenditure budget are for police and fire, leaving $74 million in this proposed budget as remaining discretionary funding that goes to uh, paying for the other general fund departments uh, and then resources available uh, to help pay down underfunded obligations that we've been talking about, like pension and OPEB, uh, to help build capacity for future budgets. So just a different way of looking at that general fund budget and how it's, uh, how it's developed. So on the next slide, uh, you know, one of the themes that you heard our city manager mention is uh, this proposed budget helps us plan for the future. And so I wanted to talk about a few of the different components uh, that are part of this budget, including uh, addressing our reserves that are built into our council adopted general fund reserves policy, as well as recommendations to establish a couple new reserves, one being a capital reserve fund, which I'll talk about a little bit, and another one being our pension reserve trust fund that the city council uh, approved in our pension funding policy at our last council meeting. And then finally, our CalPERS additional discretionary payment, uh, which I'll speak to a little bit uh, on a further slide. So first in our general fund reserves, uh, after we took into account budgeting for all of the departments and the augmentations that, that you're going to hear about, we had resources available to uh, increase our reserves up to the policy targets that the council has adopted. So that meant for the stabilization reserve fund to get up to 15% of general fund expenditures, we added $1.4 million to that reserve, bringing it to $27.7 million. For the emergency reserve, the target in the policy is 10% of general fund expenditures. We added $1.2 million to that reserve, getting it up to a new balance of $18.6 million. The purposes of those reserves are, are listed here on that slide and are part of our general fund reserves policy. So, and then we recommended transferring $10 million to a new capital reserve still part of the general fund in a separate reserve fund to address some significant capital projects that are coming forward uh, that require general fund funding that are in the planning and design phase. But as we've heard about inflation, supply chain disruption, uh, staffing shortages on capital projects, we hear time and time again about the escalating costs of construction and the timelines involved in some of these capital projects and we're going to need additional dollars to fund some of these projects. And so the recommendation in this proposed budget is to transfer $10 million to a new capital reserve fund to have additional funding available once we know the final price tags on some of these large projects that are coming forward in the planning and design phase, including the ones I listed here on the slide, the Roseville Sports Complex, uh, Weber Park, uh, Fire Station 8, and there are other ones in the queue that we don't have complete funding for and, and this will be one of the ways that we'll fund uh, the, these cost increases. Um, and, and so that's the purpose of this uh, recommendation. And then, as you heard about at our last council meeting when we talked about the financial policies, we're going to be establishing a pension trust fund uh, that will irrevocably commit general fund dollars for pension contributions in the future. Essentially, it'll be used as a rate stabilization fund to help uh, ease budgetary pressures uh, that will happen uh, as we hit a new economic downturn. Um, our employer contribution rates for our uh, pension program will uh, escalate and having a rate stabilization fund in a pension trust uh, will allow us to maintain service levels and, and uh, afford those additional contributions. Uh, we can establish this trust with an initial deposit and then we can contribute more in the future with one-time resources. For example, as we get to the end of each fiscal year, we typically have a small surplus. We can make recommendations to add to that reserve as one of the options. So in this proposed budget, we're recommending transferring $8 million to this this new reserve. $2 million came from last year's uh, year-end general fund surplus, and we have $6 million of current year resources in the fiscal year 2022-23 budget uh, that we're recommending transferring to that reserve as well. 
And then finally, we have our additional discretionary payment, or ADP. And as you'll recall, we made our first uh, additional payment uh, in the current year budget. Uh, fiscal year 22, it was about $6 million. And we estimated that in the long term, that will save us a little over 400000 a year for the next 20 years. Uh, we still are running around a 64% funded ratio in our CalPERS pension system based on our latest actuarial valuation reports, about a $415 million unfunded liability. Our annual costs in the proposed budget for next year uh, for all funds for CalPERS pensions is $52 million. That's both the annual costs plus paying down that unfunded liability. And so the benefits of making an additional discretionary payment is paying down that unfunded liability, slowly increasing the funded status of the plan, and again, building capacity into future budgets uh, by making that one-time payment now, paying off that principal so that we're not paying the higher amounts of interest on that pension liability in the future. And that's what helps us build uh, that capacity. We've uh, proposed in the, in, the, in the budget making another payment of about $6 million to CalPERS. And again, that will uh, save us about 400000 uh, actually a little bit more than 400000 a year over 20 years. So with that, I'll move on to our updated general fund five-year forecast. As a reminder, we update this forecast uh, uh, several times throughout the year uh, because it puts our staff recommendations and decisions that the city council makes into context for us. And it helps staff, too. It's a valuable exercise for us to go through this update of our five-year forecast uh, because it helps us identify and understand the different cost drivers and the different factors that affect our, all of our different revenue sources. Um, and as we regularly uh, go through this exercise, it just helps us uh, budget more accurately. Um, and so we included in the budget and brief document that you heard uh, referred to earlier and in the proposed budget book in the budget overview section, a, a simple graph of our five-year forecast that's on the next slide. And, and this graph, you know, it's a simple snapshot of the base case scenario uh, for our revenues compared to projected expenditure growth. And you can see here that the expense line, that green line, is going up faster uh, than the blue revenue line and ultimately will catch up uh, in the future. Um, but since the future is filled with a great amount of uncertainty, especially now, uh, this graph is really too simple to explain uh, our five-year forecast process, what we go through, and so I want to walk you through um, some of our assumptions and some of the different ways that we look at our five-year forecast. Um, so first, when we do this exercise, we look at, you know, what assumptions do we need to make? And so, as you know, we have uh, new labor contracts, new memorandums of understanding, MOUs. And so we build into our five-year forecast the known information from those labor contracts. Uh, we have to make an assumption about inflation, and we do uh, believe that the Federal Reserve raising interest rates over the next year or two will slow inflation at some point. Uh, we do build into our five-year forecast uh, payments on our pensions and OPEB and CIP rehab based on council-adopted policies, uh, based on the known information that we have. Uh, we build into our forecast known impacts of federal and state mandates. And we build in th new revenues that have some certainty, like the new billboard uh, agreements that were executed and will be um, going live here in the next month or two. We built that into our uh, budget and into the five-year forecast. But we don't build in things that are, are really uncertain. Um, so for example, the new MOUs have labor market adjustments. We, we made an assumption, but those labor market adjustments, because of inflation, could be higher than we would expect. And so something like that is not built in at, uh, into the the forecast. If the high period of inflation extends longer than anyone imagines, we have not built that into the forecast. However, inflation would affect our revenues and our expenses. And so, so that's something that we're going to be paying close attention to over the next couple of years. The forecast does not include new federal and state regulations that we have no ability uh, to estimate. Um, Congress and the legislature um, have a, a, a skill in developing new things, and we, we can't anticipate everything they're going to come up with. And uh, finally, new revenue sources uh, that have not yet been approved by the city council or, or, or by the community uh, are not included in the five-year forecast. So with this, those assumptions, I just wanted to walk you through the process. 
because there's a lot of uncertainty <laughs> about the local economy and the national economy, uh, we don't know what the future is going to look like. We don't have a great crystal ball. And so we create three revenue scenarios. We could create 100 revenue scenarios, but we, we, we've decided to create three. One of them we call the base scenario. Our sales tax consultant calls that the most likely scenario. Uh, we also have a more favorable revenue scenario and a less favorable revenue scenario. And you can see all three of those start at the same point on the left in the fiscal year 2023 proposed budget. And then they all grow a little bit faster over the next five years. And you can see in the final year of this uh, graph, fiscal year 2028, there's about a $40 million difference between the less favorable and the more favorable uh, revenue scenarios. So then we look at our operating expenditures in the general fund. And you can see on the far left, uh, the proposed budget has operating expenditures of $212 million. And then you'll notice it drops a little bit. And that's because the proposed budget includes those recommendations to make an additional payment to CalPERS, to transfer money to a capital reserve, to transfer money to a pension trust. Those one-time transactions are not included in the future years, so that's why you see it coming down a little bit. And then you see uh, the expenditures growing. So I wanted to just speak briefly about what is growing there. We do make an assumption in our forecast that the general fund is going to add six new positions each year uh, into that expenditure cost. Um, and we've made an additional assumption for this five-year forecast that in fiscal year 2024, next year, we would be looking at staffing a new fire station. And so that has also been built into this five-year forecast. Otherwise, the, the growth there that it's assumed is based on uh, modest salary increases and anticipated uh, benefit cost increases for our employees and any known uh, pension cost increases. But as we get farther and farther out into the future, there's more uncertainty about what those costs might be. The next graph takes those three revenue scenarios and puts them on top of the expenditure bars. And you can see that uh, the, the revenue lines start equal to the expenditure bars because we have a balanced proposed budget. And then you see those three lines have uh, different characteristics. And you can see out at the far right that that less favorable revenue scenario has us in a deficit spending position. The base revenue scenario has those lines almost crossing but not quite. And the more favorable, the re revenue line is above the expenditures. You can see a little more clearly in this next slide we call a close-up um, because it makes it a little easier to see uh, the, the, the differences. Um, and you can see there that that less favorable actually starts uh, deficit spending in fiscal year 2027. Um, hopefully you can see that that uncertainty of the forecasting uh, out several years and it, and it really shows that there's you know different out different potential outcomes um, in the future and then we show uh, an example recession forecast because uh, as you can tell the, the the base revenue and the more favorable revenue look look pretty favorable for the city general fund but we know uh, based on inflation, based on actions that the Federal Reserve is taking to slow growth to address inflation, uh, that there are risks of an economic downturn here uh, in the next few years. And so the green dotted line on this graph represents an example recession forecast. Uh, staff, uh, we can't predict what the next recession will look like, when it will happen, uh, how long or how deep it will be. Uh, so we just made up one example. And this example is based on taking what happened in the Great Recession, but cutting it in half, making it half as long and half as deep as the Great Recession. Hopefully the next recession won't be even half as bad as the Great Recession, but that's what this example shows. Um, we're not predicting when the next recession will happen. Like I said, this is just an example showing that one could start in fiscal year 2024 and last a couple years before uh, growing back. Um, and as you can see from this graph, uh, the, the deficit spending would be significant in f 
fiscal year 26, for example, and would actually exceed uh, the resources available in our stabilization reserve fund. And so that's one of the reasons why we're talking about planning for the future, building up a pension trust uh, to help us address escalating pension costs that would occur as a result of uh, an economic downturn, um, as well as saving those capital dollars uh, to help us uh, afford to build some of the significant capital projects uh, that are coming. Um, so the, really the takeaway from this is that, you know, Measure B revenue, general fund revenue are uh, helping us deliver the essential services that the community is uh, expecting, but we need to continue maintaining those uh, reserves uh, and building up our capacity in the future budgets using these additional payments to uh, CalPERS and establishing and building up that pension reserve so that when we do find ourselves in an economic downturn, whenever it may be, that we will have the resources available to make up the difference between that green dotted line and the top of those bars uh, so that we can avoid uh, a decline in service levels and uh, laying off staff. So with that, I would like to transition briefly to cover some of our general government department budgets that are included in the proposed budget uh, before you hear from uh, the other operating departments. So this table summarizes all of the general government departments uh, and their proposed budgets in the third column. And you can see in the far right column a variance from uh, the current year budget. And you'll notice that both the city council and city manager budgets are lower than the current year. And that's not because budgets have been reduced. That's just a function of higher reimbursements under our citywide cost allocation plan that come in from our other city funds. Um, so you don't have to worry about the city council and city manager budgets being cut. Uh, it's just higher reimbursements coming in. Uh, the city clerk budget uh, increase is primarily related to funding uh, to the county for the November 22 election. The city attorney's budget increase is due to the addition of that new deputy city attorney position that Scott mentioned, which I wanted to highlight is the first uh, new attorney position added uh, to the city since 2007 is, is what my understanding. Um, the finance budget increase includes converting uh, those two positions that Scott mentioned, a buyer in purchasing and an accountant uh, from limited term to regular, uh, just to handle ongoing workload as the city's growing. Uh, HR um, is the biggest increase on this list, and it includes our internal service funds for workers' compensation and general uh, liability. And those programs, particularly general liability and our insurance programs, uh, continue to see significant cost increases in insurance premiums, 30, 40 percent increases over the last few years. Um, and so that's the primary reason for that large increase. Uh, HR also includes additional dollars for training uh, for city employees, but also for supervisors and managers, because as we've been uh, dealing with changes in the workforce, we have a lot of new supervisors and managers, and so we have some training dollars uh, added to their budget. But like I said, the largest dollars there are for our uh, insurance premiums that have been going up. Our IT budget increase is primarily related to the four positions that uh, Scott described earlier. And finally, the public affairs and communications budget increase is due to funding for the every other year national community survey, as well as educational materials related to community outreach, uh, along with the limited term position to assist with outreach for city capital projects uh, to help some of our city departments do that outreach. So with that overview of our citywide budget, our general fund uh, budget, and those general government departments, we can break for questions again uh, before starting with the individual operating departments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Does the council have any questions of Scott or Dennis? Yep, I do. You go first. Councilmember Alvord. Back on the pension reserve trust, um, we have $8 million recommended in the proposed budget, so $2 million and then another six. What is the goal for that? Is are we max is eight the goal, or we have higher for the ultimate goal? We have not established a goal. As I mentioned, our unfunded liability is currently around four hundred million dollars, and so uh, I don't see a goal in sight. I would like to see us build that up to the point where, if we do have a significant economic downturn, that we can use that to help uh, continue maintaining services throughout a downturn when the community really needs uh, to rely on city services. Okay. Thanks. And then um, 
does the, the recession forecast where we had the lines going up, well, two questions in there. In the first year, it jumps 20 million different, really fast, and then it kind of gradually gets up to like 40 million or whatever over years. Why is such a big jump initially? It's primarily sales tax, because when an economic downturn typically happens, uh, sales tax reacts very quickly. Um, and during the Great Recession, we saw a significant drop off in sales tax revenue. So this is half of the percentage drop that we saw uh, in the Great Recession for sales tax. And then property tax lags by a, a year and a half or two years. And so uh, in the Great Recession, we saw property tax drop off um, by close to 8 percent, I think, over a couple of years. But that takes a while um, to, to drop off and then come back. But it's that sales tax revenue. And our general fund is, is largely dependent on sales tax revenue. So we will see a pretty significant uh, impact. And then the last question, and I'm not proposing a change, I'm just asking. So in human resources where we talked about the training, which I think is great, I think that's excellent to, to do more training. I know, you know we used to do a lot more of that in the past. Um, some of our departments, when they're, they're providing services to the other departments, the other departments have a budget for it, as opposed to putting all the budget in the one department. Um, so in this case, it didn't seem like a good to, to break that out among the departments for using that training just to stick it all in the HR? So, yeah. So our, a lot of our departments do have their own training budgets for um, educational courses, conferences, that type of thing. Um, this particular initiative was uh, targeted at citywide supervisors and managers using a, a platform that could be used across all of the departments. Okay. That's it. Okay. Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, great job. I mean... This is huge. This is three quarters of a billion dollars, right? I mean, that's not small, and and so I appreciate the uh, detail here. Um, in the first pie chart, which thankfully was not a picture of a piece of pie. <laughs> okay, thank you. We're hungry. <laughs> Scott, you mentioned that the purchased power supply at 10% is $75 million. And this may be a question that's answered by electric a little later, but... I, I, my understanding is that's actually higher now. It's 100 million. So the question embedded in there is, when is this when is this budget put to bed that these figures are based on? Um, well, this uh, the numbers were put together over the past few months. But it, mm -hmm. but as as you're alluding to, uh, we've seen the cost of power and natural gas that's used at, at the uh, energy park has, has continued to go up. So that. This budget was developed over the last few months, but right. uh, we continue to see the cost increase. And in fact, I believe you'll see a budget adjustment coming forward um, in the next council meeting or two, um, reflecting the fact that those power costs keep going up. Thanks. And now I assume that was the case. I mean, you can't, this wasn't done yesterday, so right. it's, you know, this moment in time. And so related to that, you know, the electric franchise fee, and this might be too Tech, I might not be able to form a question here, right? But we sort of we depend upon that electric franchise fee to fund a number of police, parks and rec, and what other? There was a third one in there. Um, fire. Yeah, fire. Are, is there likelihood that there would be less if their costs are going up? Does our franchise fee? get affected by that? The franchise fee is actually a percentage of their costs. So as their costs go up, the franchise fee also goes up. Okay. That's comforting to know. Um, on the capital improvement program, you have um, FY2223, and then you have a five-year CIP. Waste services doesn't change. Um, general government and IT in the five-year CIP column doesn't change. And I just caught my attention. Yeah, no, it's a great What's question. That? It's a great question, and if you look back at last year, you'll notice there were a couple other categories that also didn't change. Uh, we're really proud of the efforts that our departments went through this year uh, to really build out the five-year capital improvement program. You, you'll probably notice that there are a lot more what we called forecasted projects oh. in the budget book this year that don't use current year money but do uh, come forward over the course of the next five years. Uh, but in those two rows that you identified, we haven't completed building out the 
those couple departments for the full five-year program. Okay. They because we'll, we will buy a garbage truck or we, two. We, right? we we certainly will, now and and we in and the next we have, five years. Otherwise, we have a pretty robust ten-year. I'm pretty plan. close to the dump, so I can just haul my own, right? <laughs> We also I'm have sorry, a pretty robust 10-year ten ten replacement program for our software, and we just haven't built it into the budget right. yet. Um, and then can you um, – and then and then this kind of goes back to um, – so on your funnel, right, you have less uh, – you start off with $212 million general operating budget, and then it says less police and fire, $77 million, but a little bit later on when I add those two pie charts together – it comes to 96 million. But it's after we subtract out those uh, revenues that might be directly related to okay. those services. Great. I love it. All right, one more. So I cannot. I don't get that. So in the general fund forecast infographic, right, it appears that you're starting FY24 at $200 million in expenses. Oh, aren't we at $212 million in expenses in FY23? Yes. So, so what am I missing? I'm so the reason for that is that the proposed budget for fiscal year 23, that $212 million, uh -huh. that includes the $6 million to the additional discretionary payment to CalPERS. Okay. That includes $6 million to transfer to the pension trust, right. and it includes $10 million to transfer to the capital reserve. Those were considering one-time decisions by the council as part of the proposed budget. We're not assuming that we'll make those same decisions in fiscal year 24 or beyond. Can you do that one more time? Sure. There are some one-time decisions that are included in the proposed budget for fiscal year 23 that are not included in fiscal year 24. And so those, those transfers come out. That's why the total expenditures come down. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Any other questions before we move on to the department? Just one question. Um, on the pension trust funds, I think in your slide presentation, you had suggested $8 million. That was the number you threw out. Um, and then I just heard $6 million. So I, I was just curious what went into the... Uh, equation factor to, to get to eight million with, with I'm sure there was some calculation as to what a good starting point would be and I just kind of want some clarification is it eight or is it six and it, whichever one it is how do we arrive at that number yeah great great question so we had uh, recommended using two million of the surplus from last year when we closed out the books to kick start this pension trust fund and then as we developed the budget for next year uh, we had six million available to add to that. So six plus okay. the two equals the eight. And one of the reasons that we did that is we said, and we've seen other cities do this, they, they look at how much surplus they have, they put half of it into an additional discretionary payment to CalPERS and put half of it into their pension trust fund. And so we said, hey, we did six million of an ADP last year, let's do six million of an ADP this year and put six million on top of that initial two uh, into the pension trust. Okay, I apologize. I didn't calculate the uh, the two million that we're carrying over. Oh, so the, the six question. additional. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will open this portion up to public comment. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to comment on what we've heard so far? Okay, I'll close public comment. Thank you both very much. And the first department overview that we will be hearing this evening is from police. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Bernasconi and Council. I'm Captain Kelby Newton, and with me is our budget analyst, Mark Pinedo, to give you an overview of the police department budget proposal for the coming year. <coughs> the 
in July, we have some changes planned in how our department is structured as we move from three divisions to four. I'd like to talk about those real quickly. Currently, we have operations, services, and support services. However, as a part of our strategic planning process, we have reorganized our four division, our three divisions into four. Operations, which will be the home of, for patrol. Investigative services, which houses all of our investigations units. Community services, where teams like social services, school resource officers, and traffic will reside. The fourth new one will be our professional services, which includes communications, records, <coughs> and property. The move to four divisions brings our community service programs like SSU higher up in our organization and our investigations unit is busy enough and big enough to also become its own division. Overall this year, from looking at the slide, our budget proposal is $54.8 million, which has been previously said. It's up from 48.9 million from last year. Last year, the overall PD budget accounted for 27% of the city's general fund budget, while this year it accounts for 26% over the, of the overall general fund. By far, our biggest expense is staffing as the police department is a people business. The majority of our budget this year is the same as last year with staffing and programs that carry forward year after year. However, we do have some exciting new plans and additions we'd like to talk about. So we're asking for new positions. Two will, uh, as city manager Casey mentioned earlier, with measure B, the two officers will completely staff our seven beat system um, by bringing two more officers on each side of the week on our graveyard shifts. Police sergeant, uh, we're asking for two positions that will work uh, to identify staffing uh, shortages and workload issues that we have. We're asking for a new communications supervisor uh, for adequate supervisor coverage, uh, including our graveyard shift. A new animal control officer um, that will provide more um, personnel to uh, cover for calls for service and staffing. We have not added a uh, new ACO position since 1993. Our police officer, um, Another police officer position is in our professional standards unit. That person will, has been identified to be responsible for the body worn camera program and assist with background investigations. And we're also asking for five police officers as well to help patrol uh, alleviate issues related to officers out on injury. Overall, this is the largest single year investment in police department staffing in many years. In the 25 years I've been with the city, I've never seen this money. So thank you. Budget highlights. For training, we have $26,600 in new funding. Programs, we have $142,000 in new funding. And equipment, $70,000 in new funding. I'll highlight a couple of the, the budget highlights above. Uh, it's been mentioned uh, throughout the presentation. The real-time crime center software and video is $85,000 that we're asking for. This is a three-year contract for annual software costs and video integration devices as we gain access to additional cameras throughout the city. $18,000 for our Bluetooth integrated technology system is an add on our, to our existing body-worn camera system. This will allow officers to have their body-worn cameras start via Bluetooth whenever they activate, activate their uh, emergency sirens and lights in their patrol vehicle. Flock has also been mentioned throughout the presentation. $47,000 for Flock. This is an annual cost. This will bring the city up to 20 cameras, or the police department up to 20 cameras, Flock cameras. <clears throat> this will be moved into the general fund, and this completes our LPR coverage across the city. This has been a very uh, beneficial program for the police department and our patrol division, and also for our investigations division as well after the fact. $10,000 for community policing, engagement, and communications. 
budget guided by the PD strategic plan, the public affairs unit intends to use a multi-layered approach that balances social media, website, direct mail, digital ads, news articles, in-person presentations, community events, flyers, and assessment tools. And last, I'd like to talk about the $11,000 for our procedural justice and implicit bias program. Investigations training funds will help support training for our instructor group to help increase awareness and knowledge around current social issues affecting police and the community we serve. With that being said, does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much. Does the council have any questions of Captain Newton? No, I'm just glad. I, I was just interested to see the Bluetooth integrated uh, technology so that you, didn't, you can tell your body camera you wanted it on. I think they're all good for, for Rosso. Yes, they are. This is great news for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'll open it up to public comment. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to comment on the presentation our police department has provided? I'll close public comment. Anything else from council? I'm glad we're getting beat seven fully staffed and I, I know people are gonna be excited to have those additional officers as well, so thank you. Okay, I think that's it. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you all very much. This was very thorough news for us. Next up is um, uh, we'll be hearing from our fire chief and after that we'll be hearing from our parks, recreation and library. So we'll start off with our fire chief Rick Barty. Good evening. Good evening. I'll sit close to you Dennis. Thank you. <clears throat> All about. Hmm. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Rick Barty. As you said, I'm the fire chief for the city of Roseville. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the fire department. As you can see up there, um, I am proud, or actually, I wanted to be, do say this. I am proud to say that the Roseville Fire Department is a full service, all hazards fire department capable of responding to any type of fire, emergency medical services, rescue, or hazardous materials. We have eight fire stations that we've talked about before that are strategically located throughout the city. As you can see up there, we only have uh, four uh, different divisions within our department. You know, admin administration implements city policies, as you know, and in programs, including management of the various programs, including budget and within the fire department. Our fire and life safety division is a big part of the fire department's efforts in community risk um, reduction, improving the city's quality of life for the citizens of Roseville. This group combined with the operations side of the house performed over four uh, 4,100 fire code inspections and, uh, in the last year in enforcements. Um, throughout our public education activities, our crews and our inspectors reached over 3,500 students this last year. In the operations division, um, it responds to all the hazards to meet the routine and catastrophic needs of our community, whether it be those medical calls, fires, technical rescue, hazardous materials, um, mass casualty incidents and other type of emergency calls. And in this, last, this past year, we responded over 18,000 calls for service in the last year, which is an increase of over 2,000 calls from the years of service in 2020. And our fire training, of course, division provides and tracks training for all members of the department to ensure the firefighters are maintain their certifications, the proficiencies. Um, at our training center itself, it's used for firefighters within the department and other city departments, and it's a regional training center. And of course, our support services deals with all our logistical, purchasing, and management support for the business of the side of the fire department. Next slide. As um, Dennis talked about a little bit earlier, you know, as, as with all the other city departments, fire is a service-driven department, as Dom had mentioned a little earlier. Um, with this new budget, we will have 120 authorized positions if this budget goes through. That's up one position from 119, which is the fire department's been at since about 2014 or so. Um, as you can see, and Dennis mentioned a little bit earlier, 82% of the fire's um, $41.7 million budget is in operations, which is where the rubber meets the road and all the business that's done with our service that our, our, our swarm members provide. 
The next big, uh, largest piece of the, buy, of the pie is our materials and supplies. That's where we need to perform our duties, um, come down our support services. Um, in FY21, our budget of revenue for the first responder fee was about $745,000. Recently, we brought forth to the council a budget request to increase that uh, revenue amount a bit to make up for uh, the amount of money we had been bringing in over this last year. And as you can see up there, our projected revenue now for next year is about $1.2 million with related expenses and the net revenue coming out to about $966,000 as opposed to $775,000. And we only have one new position coming into fire this year. It's an admin battalion chief. Um, the admin battalion chief will work a regular 40-hour work week. Actually, he gets to go hang out with me. Um, we will have the primary responsibility for the first responder fee, policy oversight, including the policy interpretation and updating the policy as needed. Service department's liaison for the first responder fee with the billing vendor. The battalion chief will also be the department's contact for the first responder to the customer's inquiries and disputes. The battalion chief will be responsible for the continuing quality improvement for our field personnel and documentation when they provide medical services. Anyway, this position will also have some additional duties and responsibilities related to the fire's logistics. Um, equipment, apparatus, and facilities, fire and EMS training, and be serve as a fire um, safety officer, just to name a few things. One thing I wanted to point out here a little bit about grant summary. Dennis talked about all the different revenues that goes in the fire's budget or in the PD's budget. And with this slide, we just wanted to highlight that fire continues to look for opportunities to lessen the impacts of the general fund as much as possible or finding state, local, federal grants to help replace needed or aging equipment along with some of the up-to-date training that our, our, our members received throughout the year. Um, last year, in the last uh, three years here, we've had over $1.2 million in the last three years that we've been awarded by looking for these grants. And then right now in the queue, we got a little over $200,000 coming in for the year 2022. Hopefully this one plays for us. It's actually a graphic here where I wanted to point out, you know, several years ago we had an, op an operational study that was performed by a third vendor and uh, using a significant amount of objective data. With Station 8 being in the design phase of development, we want to show how well the past and current city planners have done to help see where Station 8 will help uh, fire meet its response reliability goals. Engine 8 will provide relief to Station 9 and 5, allowing them to be available um, as you can see in areas of the west as the slide fills in um, as our population keeps uh, growing to the west. And this has uh, been done over the last seven years. With that, I'll ask you any questions. Okay, thank you. Does council have any questions of Chief Barty? Chief, what were the bracketed numbers on that <laughs> animation? The bracketed numbers? Yeah, so it said... Uh, Those are by years. Yeah, 2014 it had bracketed 391, and then 2022, 153. Does that represent? What does that represent? The parcels that have been filled in throughout those years. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, just a comment. I'm I'm very impressed on what you've been able to do with with different grants. Uh, uh, coming up with uh, you know like the Lucas devices and the training for um, uh, working on on the railroads and hazardous material. It's uh, just, it's very good. I'm really impressed. Uh, and I see the new position for the administrative battalion chief is going to do support emergency medical services first and, and work on the responder fee. I think just so that um, people really understand what that, that means, because when it happens, sometimes people are at their worst time in their life. You know, something's happening and they're not and not really understanding. And and I know that um, when they've come back later and talked to people there in the fire department, it's really made a difference and it's helped them understand. And and in many, if not most cases, they, there wasn't a fee that they had to pay themselves. It was right. their insurance or or it it was um, not needed to be be paid at that particular instance. So I'm I'm. I'm happy to see that you have that new position, and but I also know that the people that you've been having doing it have done a good job. Right. Thank you very much. Nice job, Chief. 
Uh, just a, a question. Um, you have been really resourceful on finding money out there. Great job. So on the first uh, summary from 2019 to 21 is about the Lucas device, and it's also included in uh, potential up incoming dollars. Can you just talk about um, what that supplemental dollars could potentially do when it comes to the Lucas device? Hang on a second here. I think you maybe mentioned about or had talked about it offline around maybe one per station, or is that kind of the plan to expand it throughout the city? So this year, uh, Mayor, a couple years ago, we last budget year, we were able to get two Lucas devices, and we put them on the east side of town. And over the last year, we saw how successful they were and how much they did help to survivability of some of the patients that we treated with those. We were able to get eight more of those. So they're already all, all 10 apparatus have a Lucas device on them now. Excellent. And will you just say real briefly what that is? Lucas device, so when a person has to do CPR, so uh, it's a pretty labor-intensive, if anybody's ever done CPR as far as a person goes, and it's, it can be a little inconsistent as far as the death and pressure that somebody gives when they're needing to have uh, CPR performed on them as far as chest compressions go and breathing. So this device here actually takes over the breathing and chest compression to make it more consistent as far as the level goes and provides better perfusion lack of a better term, of the blood and the oxygen while they're getting that treatment. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Just another method to save more lives. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. Any other comments, questions of the chief before I open up to public comment? I'll um, open this up to public comment. Is there anyone here tonight that would like to comment on our uh, fire department's presentation? Okay. I'll close public comment. Thank you so much. Okay, and next up we'll be hearing from Jill Geller, our Director of Parks, Recreation, and Libraries on um, her department. Well, good afternoon, Mayor Bernasconi and members of the council. I am Jill Geller, your Parks, Recreation, and Libraries Director. It's my pleasure to present to you our budget for the upcoming oh. fiscal year. Mm -hmm. As you're aware, the Parks, Recreation, and Libraries Department oversees all of the city's parks, its recreation programs and facilities, and its libraries. We currently manage 79 developed parks and nearly 4,000 acres of open space. Additionally, we maintain more than 300 acres of streetscapes and 40 acres of school properties. We also manage and maintain more than 30 facilities. These include our three libraries, three swimming pools, two golf courses, the Roseville Sports Center, Maidu Community Center, Maidu Museum and Historic Site, and 19 Adventure Club sites. So quite a bit falls under our department's purview. PRL's overall operating budget proposed for FY23 is $43.4 million. This is made up of the different areas that you see on this pie chart with parks and open space being the largest portion at 34%, approximately one-third of our budget. Um, there are several funds, including the Youth Development Fund and Golf Fund, that make up the entire Parks, Recreation, and Libraries budget. The total PRL General Fund operating budget is $31.1 million. This makes up 15% of the city's general fund operating budget. And 24% of our general fund expenditures are covered by revenue offsets, with the majority of these being our recreation program fees. Budget highlights this year include some new positions for our department, as you heard. The first on this list is an agronomics technician. PRL maintains more than 100 ball fields throughout the city, and we added 10 new Bermuda fields to our inventory in 2021. Keeping the fields in good condition with their high demand and high volume of use requires staff with specialized knowledge in turf maintenance. So this new agronomics technician will have this knowledge and will lead our agronomics team. Three new parks maintenance workers will help us maintain our ever-increasing and highly used parks. One of these will serve on the agronomics team that I just referenced, and the other two will provide leadership in our portering services. Portering is the daily cleaning and maintenance of our parks, basically our work to keep them safe, clean, and green. We've typically used part-time staff on our portering crews, but as you know, it's become very challenging to recruit and retain part-time staff, so we're redirecting some part-time dollars to fund these full-time positions. The safety and cleanliness of our parks is priority one, and it's the first thing our residents see, so it makes sense to have reliable, knowledgeable, full-time staff leading this crew. 
The senior tree trimmer will assist in maintaining our 40,000 city-owned trees. This position will help us promptly, more efficiently, and more cost-effectively address some of our tree maintenance tasks. And we are utilizing contract savings to fund this position. The park project technician will provide oversight of our many new park developments and park rehab projects. We currently have a contractor serving in this role and feel we can more efficiently bring these services in-house. So we'll use those contract dollars to fund this position. The libraries are busier than ever with circulations and digital downloads of more than 1.2 million in 2021 and in-person visits, visits to our libraries of more than 700,000. More than 400,000 of these visits were to the Riley Library. So this uh, proposal converts a part-time librarian position to full-time, uh, allowing us to meet that demand at Riley Library. And then our last position is a recreation leader to provide a second full-time staff person at My Doom Museum and Historic Site. We've recently increased our open hours at the museum and we'll be able to increase them even more with the hiring of this full-time position. This again is not a completely new position, but the conversion of a part-time position to full-time. And as always, we've been thoughtful in our new position requests. We're mo mostly utilizing dollars previously budgeted for contracts or temporary staff, so only a small fraction of the cost for these positions is a new request of the general fund. Aside from our new positions, we do have a few additional requests, the first being for uh, backflow inspection, testing and repair, PRL has 180 general fund owned backflow devices within our park streetscapes and facilities, which are required to have annual inspection and testing. Environmental utilities will do this inspection, testing and repair, uh, but these costs must be funded by the backflow owner, which in this case is the general fund. So this is an additional request of $17,000. Uh, for park amenity replacements, we have developed a 10-year rehab and replacement schedule, one piece of which is to maintain the appearance and safety of our aging facilities. So this request includes replacement of park amenities, such as benches, picnic tables, drinking fountains, shade structures, and so on. With 79 parks and literally thousands of amenities, our 10-year plan shows that we would need millions to keep up with this replacement schedule. But recognizing that a request of that magnitude is not feasible, Feasible. This request is for $100,000 for FY23. While this only touches the surface to replace our aging park amenities, we will absolutely put these funds to good use and will conduct assessments each year to determine priorities on how these dollars are spent. The Maidu Museum and Historic Site Exhibit Planning is a request of $5,000 to fund a consultant to evaluate the scope and costs for exhibit improvements. Since the time that the Maidu Museum and Historic Site was built over 15 years ago, the main exhibit space has not been updated. The panels are outdated and part of the exhibits are no longer functioning. So in order to encourage return visitation and to increase revenues through memberships, ticket sales, and programming, museum exhibits should be refreshed on a five to 10 year cycle. So again, this will uh, fund a consultant and pending the consultant's evaluation and recommendation, any funding to complete the recommend updates to the exhibits would be requested in future years. For um, my due museum and historic site programming, we look forward to adding more services and programs at the museum with the addition of another recreation leader that I previously mentioned. These new programs require materials and supplies. However, new revenues from the additional programs and hopefully increased memberships and facility rentals resulting from the additional operational hours will more than offset this request for the additional programming supplies. Historic district public parking lot maintenance. The city has leased a parking lot in the historic district to accommodate parking for visitors to this area, and PRL has assumed responsibility for maintenance of this parking lot. Uh, this funding exceeds what the historic LLD can support, so we are requesting general fund support of just $5,000 for maintenance of this public parking lot. And our last ad request is for downtown library security. 
Uh, the severity of customer behaviors violating the code of conduct seems to have escalated at the downtown library, as has building vandalism, damage, and safety concerns. Our current security vendor has been ineffective in addressing these concerns, so we plan to enlist uh, the security company who already supports the downtown Roseville area and can provide these improved services. This re results in additional expense of 23000 So the total of all six of these requests is $150,000. So to talk a little bit about how our efforts align with your strategic goals, we remain fiscally responsible in a changing world by creating new programs and events to generate increased revenues, by evaluating our program fees, seeking partnerships and grant opportunities, and expanding our use of volunteers. We support community engagement and advocacy by engaging our residents through our various forms of communications. This includes our award-winning Experience PRL magazine, our popular videos, including what's happening in PRL, e-newsletters, website, and social media. And we also support community engagement and advocacy by conducting public workshops. We've held more than 20 public meetings in the past year, both virtual and in person, seeking input on our strategic master plan, park master plans, upgrades to park amenities, and more. Regarding maintaining a safe and healthy community, I know I sound like a broken record when I say everything we do makes a healthier you, but I so feel it's true. Every single thing that Parks, Recreation, and Libraries does contributes to the health of our community. We enhance our community's economic vitality through the many sports venues we operate that draw visitors to Roseville. And Parks, Recreation, and Libraries is more uh, is an economic driver beyond just promoting tourism by increasing home values, uh, improving air and water quality, and attracting businesses, talented workers, and new residents to Ro Roseville. We have a constant focus on delivering exceptional city services. Our new strategic master plan will guide our efforts to deliver these services in the coming year. We consistently evaluate our organizational structure to ensure the efficient and effective delivery of these services. And we optimize the use of data, data and technology to improve the delivery of our services as well. And lastly, to support the council goal to invest in well-planned infrastructure and growth. Once again, our strategic master plan will help guide our future decision-making and prioritization. We do place a priority on re reinvesting in our aging infrastructure as funding allows, and as you saw in our additional requests this year. We continue to develop new parks in growth areas, and we effectively manage our open spaces, preserves, and streetscapes. In closing, I just want to say that perhaps one positive outcome of COVID is that it reintroduced many people to the outdoors, and parks, recreation, and libraries have been seen as an essential service. I want to share a few facts that we learned through the strategic master plan process. We learned that residents appreciate our services, and they just want more of them. 88% of our residents agree that PRL improves their physical health and wellness, and 87% of residents agree that PRL improves their mental health. 89% of residents agree that PRL makes Roseville a more desirable place to live. And I can't close before calling your attention to the logos at the bottom of this slide. The great work of our staff and your great leadership has resulted in Roseville Parks, Recreation, and Libraries being recognized by the National Recreation and Park Association uh, for the National Gold Medal for Excellence in Park and Recreation Management. This means that we're considered one of the top four agencies in the nation serving communities with populations between 75,000 and 150,000. And I hope this recognition is an indication of our effective management of our resources. And then the logo on the right is from the California Park and Recreation Society. And while it states that parks make life better, we know that in Roseville, parks, recreation, and libraries makes life better. And none of our work would be possible without our great city leadership and your support. So thank you. Thank you very much. Curious about that other 10 or 12 percent. <laughs> they just haven't got it I'm worried yet. about them. They haven't yes. got it yet. Okay. Uh, does any of the council members have any comments or questions of Jill? I have just three comments. I was uh, really happy to hear that we're um, going to start bringing um, some of that MIDU work in-house and kind of phasing out the contractors. I think that's a good thing. Any time that we can have something in-house and have more control, uh, I, I think is always good. Um, 
I like the additional uh, hours across many of the, the libraries and the museums that you mentioned. I mean, I think that's that's only good. And then um, I just want to say I, I've been in my view several times and a couple field trips over the years, and I'm really happy. I agree that some of that has seen it a better days. I mean, we've got our life out of them. So the funding for the rehab and the additional supplies there, um, I think will go a long way and hopefully enticing uh, additional opportunities from schools and teachers and librarians and other areas to come and, and, and view what we have. We have a really great resource out there. And I think with a refresher, you know, it, it'll, it will be really, really nice. So I was happy to hear that. So thank you for your presentation. I would say uh, I echo um, what uh, Councilman uh, Mendoza said. Um, I remember when Maidu had to cut back because of the recession. I, I very, very vividly remember that, and a lot of, and all, all of our city services. And so, to have that opportunity to uh, bring it back to life again, and it, it's a fabulous place. It's. Um, not only not only for kids, it's for adults and for having uh, venues there, because I've been there before for venues, and I was there when they actually changed out uh, different uh, um, programs and things they had so that it was refreshed. So it's going to be nice to see it alive again, and not only not only Maidu, but all make sure all of our uh, parks stay refreshed. And I, I'm really glad that we had the strategic master plan. And um, as we're building the new parks, we don't forget the old parks because they're all our parks. And we go all, all different areas, and people get to in, really enjoy them. And uh, I really appreciate what the, all the you people do in the parks department. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, continuing on the theme, um, so I did half of the docent training and saw the Maidu um, museum is an historic site and I'm looking forward to the campfires this summer and the programming that will be there because it's a real all our libraries are real assets to this community and uh, build a better quality of life and um, you know are more equitable or are equitable to all so thank you Okay, thank just, you. Just love what we do. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. thank you, Joe, for everything, and thanks for the deep dive you've taken into with the uh, master strategic plan too. Yeah, thanks. So you. you can always improve. Good job. Okay, we have three more departments we'll hear from. We have um, development services. Public comment. Oh, public comment. thank you. I'll open up to public comment. Is there anyone here that would like to make a, a comment on the presentation we just heard? Okay, thank you. I'll close public comment. We have development services next, and then afterwards, public works, and then economic development. Good evening, Council Members. I'm Mike Isom, your Development Services Director. Thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the Development Services Department's budget for uh, fiscal 23. Just a reminder who we are and the services we perform. We're actually six budgeted divisions, but we provide services in four uh, functional areas. We have 86 employees. Uh, our first division is building permit. If we could get to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, building Permit Center and Code Enforcement Division uh, is responsible for building plan review and inspection. They manage our Permit Center, which is the city's one-stop shop for development permits. And as you know, Code Enforcement is responsible for community-wide nuisance and blight abatement and sign enforcement. And beginning in fiscal 23, and I'll talk about this later in the presentation, uh, management of the graffiti's abatement program. Business and Administrative Services is uh, an internal support division to Development Services, so they provide administrative support to the various divisions within Development Services. They manage citywide addressing uh, and land-based data, so all the addressing that goes into the CAT system for 911 purposes, that's all maintained by our department. Uh, they maintain the city's development records and data. They manage our SELA automation platform, which is the city's enterprise permitting software, so that's used by uh, at least uh, 10 or 12 different departments that are involved in the development process and permitting. And most importantly, they manage our project billing, so they bring in about $4 million in revenue in uh, secondary labor uh, for full-cost projects. Engineering land development reviews infrastructure improvement plans, and they inspect new topside and underground infrastructure as it's built, so roads and, and pipes. They maintain the city's traffic impact analysis and mitigation fee program, primarily our tra traffic mitigation fee. And they also provide staff support to the South Placer Regional Transportation Authority. And then lastly, as you know, planning oversees the city's land use planning and general plan, zoning, 
They process development entitlements, and they also participate in regional planning efforts with uh, regional partners like SACOG and others. So for fiscal 23, uh, excluding the impact fee funds that we control, our operating budget is right around 11.9 million. Uh, within that number is about 657,000 for technology-related expenditures from the Development Services Technology Fee Fund, and that's a fee that's added on to all uh, permits that we issue that helps pay for development supporting technology platforms like SL Automation, again, our, our permitting system, electronic plan check, and uh, other similar systems. And these are for things like licensing costs, uh, upgrades, uh, initial acquisition of the systems to begin with, and then consultant costs for support and maintenance. Uh, so our true general fund operating budget is about $11.2 million, and that's broken down by the categories on the screen. What's important to remember about that number is that it does include expenditure off offsets of about $3.4 million in staff time reimbursements for full cost development projects and other internal labor reimbursements. So we get uh, reimbursed for services that we perform for other departments or on behalf of other departments. And so rather than revenue, that's just reflected as a, a, an offset or a reduction in our expenses. So our expenses are further offset by another uh, projected $5.4 million in various permit fees. So between the full cost projects and the permit fees, we bring in about $8.8 .8 million in various forms of cost recovery. That's what we're projecting for the next year. So the overall net impact of the general fund is budgeted at about $5 million. And we expect to do better than, than that as we have in years past, but that's what we budgeted. Um, and then that $5 million uh, really reflects the services that we can't charge for. So general government type services like code enforcement, uh, neighborhood outreach, regional coordination. If somebody comes to the counter and asks what their zoning is, we probably ought not charge for something like that. So it's those types of general government services that we don't charge for. And that's what's reflected in that uh, net cost of the general fund. So we will ex uh, see our expenses increase next year, and it's primarily in four key areas. The first is uh, increases in IT and facilities internal services funds. Those are increases that are beyond our control. They're, they're just uh, given to us by, uh, by the finance department. They tell us what they are, and we budget for them. Uh, increases in fuel and fleet costs, uh, which I'll uh, talk about in a minute. Uh, we do have a new position that we're asking for in code enforcement, which I'll, we'll also talk about in a minute, and then a new $100,000 contract, $100, contract for graffiti abatement. We did submit an ad request for our material supplies and services budget. It was right around $55,000, and that is primarily due to uh, increase in fuel and fleet costs, and the rising price of gasoline is the primary driver there. Uh, the good news is, is we're able to offset most of these costs due to a uh, budgeted or uh, anticipated 3% increase in our secondary labor this year. So uh, it's, it's been a busy past couple of years. We expect that trend to continue into next fiscal year. So we're, we're assuming a 3% increase in our uh, cost recovery for the full cost projects. And then also, if you recall, in April, the council approved uh, fee increases to our permit fees uh, associated with the uh, regulatory and user fee schedule. So uh, those flat fees will go up as well. So circling back to the new position I referenced, uh, we are proposing to add a new code enforcement, a code enforcement inspector position. And uh, what we're trying to do is move the needle on the council's goal of strengthening code enforcement efforts, particularly in the area of graffiti abatement and blight abatement. So adding that position would allow us to take on management of the graffiti abatement program from the police department, which I, they are very excited to hand over the reins of, uh, of that program. Uh, but with that additional body, we'll be able to do that successfully. So in concept, this position would be more proactive in nature. As you know, our code enforcement is uh, more reactive. We get a complaint, we go out and deal with it. This position is intended to be more proactive. They'll basically patrol the city look, looking for graffiti and other types of blight. Uh, and then they will uh, get right on that and, and do the enforcement and abatement that needs to be, uh, to be done. They'll also um, coordinate uh, a proposed contract, uh, hence the uh, $100,000 ad for graffiti abatement. We're uh, proposing to launch a pilot project to hire a third party vendor, one, one or more third party vendors, uh, to actually go out and clean up the uh, graffiti. So once it's found by the inspector or if somebody calls it in, we'll have a 24, 48-hour turnaround time, whatever it is, for that company to go out and get it cleaned up, and then we'll invoice the asset owner accordingly. So we're, uh, we're going to try that out this year. We'll see how it goes. But for sure, we will definitely be more proactive in looking for the graffiti and getting the appropriate asset owner to clean it up as quickly as possible. 
So uh, aside from that, uh, we expect another busy year, as I mentioned, uh, but we look forward to the challenge. And uh, that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Great. Thank you. Does the council have any questions of Mike? Mike, uh, real quick, the code enforcement inspector that you spoke of, the one additional one you want to add, that one of their primary jobs will be to assist in the graffiti, the work with the contractor, or is it two separate things? They'll, they'll basically oversee the graffiti abatement program. So they'll oversee the contractor, they'll manage that contract, but okay. they'll also be out driving around looking for stuff to send the contractor to. Okay, so we'll actually have two people on, they'll be overseeing it, but they, they'll still be out there. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then you'd mentioned graffiti abatement and other blight. Can I, can I assume that would also mean, you know, working in conjunction with the rest of the services, like the homeless camps and different things that we deal with? Yeah. So, so blight generally refers to, you know, or we refer to it, tall weeds, signage, um, you know, damaged or, or uh, down fencing, you know, the types of things that we normally get complaints about, but we'll be more proactive in, in contacting property owners to get it cleaned up. Perfect. I just wanted to clarify that. Good, good news. Thank you. Any questions over here? On their gra graffiti abatement, um, third-party vendor, what would they offer that our staff wouldn't be able to offer? It's a, they, nothing, um, but it would free up staff to do other things. So uh, right now, uh, response to graffiti involves the streets division, the electric department, uh, environmental utilities from time to time. We have to coordinate with Comcast. We have to coordinate with PG&E. So our hope is, is we can get uh, that contractor to respond on behalf of all of those different asset owners. We have a lot of details to work out. I'm not sure quite exactly how it's going to work yet, but that's those are the details that we need to kind of get into. And you're shooting for the like 48 hour roughly turnaround. Yeah, we'll have to negotiate that, but that would be my preference is to have that have it cleaned up within 48 to 72 hours. Okay, thanks. And will the contractor clean it up or the asset owner? The the contractor would clean it up. Okay. And then if it's an enterprise-owned asset, we'll, we'll have to talk about billing the enterprise. I have to talk with the other uh, enterprise department heads about this, but uh, to bill them for the cleanup. Mike, do other cities have um, um, a contracted um, code enforcement like that? It's all, yeah, it's, it's all over the board. Um, some they use internal city forces. Uh, that tends to be more expensive just because of the, the vehicle costs, the fuel costs, you know, the staff time. Um, I can't tell you offhand which cities use that model, but I know they're out there. Okay. I'm, I think that's, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that we're going to try to do as much as we can. I, I feel, um, I'm, every time I see something, I take a picture of it and send it in. And, um, and I don't think I'm the only one or other people see it. It just makes our beautiful city look trashy. And I think uh, anything we can do or, you know, and anybody who sees something to report to the city so that, because all the eyes and ears of the community are what makes our city you know, stay nice. So, you know, I encourage people to, whether it's our new uh, position that's coming on or what we're doing right now, to report them. And those are, um, I have two questions on that. So it might just be helpful. I know this isn't really part of it, but when you do see, when our residents do see something, what is the best way? Can you share that they that they should report it because it bothers residents, right? It's, yep, we, we, I know we hear about it all the time. So can you just share that with us? Sure. Uh, right now, as I, as I sit here today until we actually take over responsibility for graffiti, uh, the police department handles the complaints, but there is an online reporting tool. If you go on the city's website and... Uh, uh, under one of the, the tabs, there is a, a graffiti reporting uh, link to follow, and you uh, just fill out a brief uh, online report, and it goes straight to the police department, and then they, as I said here today, are coordinating the response to that. Great. So online. Um, the second part of that is that as this transitions into your department from police department, um, you know, fighting graffiti and blight is really an uphill battle, um, and it seems like we're trying our best to stay ahead of it, but it's really difficult. Um, has there been any discussion around public education campaign or um, consequences that perpetrators would face, you know, if caught? I mean, is that part of any sort of um, consequence that people can have that might deter them potentially? I don't know. I mean, that's certainly important, but that hasn't been our focus. Our focus has been strictly on the, the response uh, to, to the complaints and the proactive um, uh, searching for it and getting it cleaned up. But we can certainly 
yep. uh, you know, in the future follow on with educational outreach. Yep. I just, I mentioned that because hopefully we're becoming a city where people, we can deter people from committing crimes here with our flock cameras and the additional law enforcement. So I just put that out there that, you know, maybe Roseville's not the place that you want to do that. Like we will hopefully hold them accountable as much as we can. And it's been our experience that graffiti begets graffiti, that if somebody sees graffiti, then they'll yep. they'll tend to tag the same asset or, or something close by. And if it's not there, then maybe they won't think to do it. So if we can get it cleaned up faster, we may see results from that as well. Okay. You're right. I'd like to catch the tagger. Yeah. You know, I kept saying, if you catch them, they can help be on that graffiti cleanup team. Uh, to catch them, I, I would need help from my police department uh, partners. Yeah, but, but you know, then, you, then they put their picture online on their Facebook page, and then it's just a feeding frenzy of, you know. Okay, um, I will, unless the council has any other comments, I'll open it up to public comment and see if there's anyone here who would like to make a comment on the presentation we just heard. Okay, seeing none, I'll close public comment. Thank you so much. Okay, and next up we have our Public Works Director, Jason Tchaikowski. Hello. Hello. Good evening, good evening Mayor Bernersconi and members of the council. My name is Jason Tchaikowski and I'm your Public Works Director. It's my pleasure to present to you tonight an overview, a very short overview of the fiscal year 23 Public Works operating budget. So first, uh, to set some context for the Public Works budget, I think an overview of the breadth of divisions and services provided by Public Works is helpful. Public Works is divided into six divisions responsible for a wide range of services. Uh, Public Works administration provides review, oversight, direction, and coordination for the department. Engineering oversees the design and construction of roads, bridges, bike trails, traffic signals, and road resurfacing. They also protect our community through management of the city's floodplain and early warning flood alert system. They manage traffic operations throughout the city using their varied intelligent transportation tools. They review requests for crosswalks, stop signs, and permit parking through their traffic study program. And they maintain the city's traffic signals, intelligent transportation system, and underground fiber network. The street maintenance division maintains the city's roads and drainage system. They seal the cracks in our roads and remove and repave portions of failing streets. They repair potholes. They sweep the streets, install and replace traffic signs and pavement markings, complete traffic study improvements like adding crosswalks and stop signs, conduct planned community event and emergency traffic control, and they clear our streets of leaves every fall. The Alternative Transportation Division owns and manages the city's bus system. They run the South Placer Transit Information Center where riders can make dial-a-ride reservations and get help with planning their transit trips throughout most of Placer County. They provide oversight and planning for bike and pedestrian facilities. They implement the city's transportation system management ordinance working to reduce single occupancy vehicle travel on our roads. They're encouraging biking, ride sharing, using bus and rail, and telecommuting at the city's larger places of employment. They work with our schools to encourage walking and biking to class through creating and identifying safe routes for children to get to school. And they oversee the training and locations of the city, city's crossing guard program. The Fleet Services Division purchases, manages, and maintains the city's 900 plus vehicle fleet, which includes everything from motorcycles and police cars to buses and garbage trucks. And the Facility Services Division maintains and, man and cleans all city-owned buildings and structures from city fire stations to our parking garages. They manage the planning and design and construction of city buildings, and they also oversee facility improvements ranging from painting to major remodels. The Public Works operating budget for fiscal year 23 totals $55.4 million. Of that, $10.3 million is general fund money. Uh, we receive about 25% of our general uh, fund expenditures are covered by revenue offsets. Um, and as you can see, the largest piece of the pie is fleet services. Fleet services is funded through an internal service fund, or an ISF, where other city departments and public works divisions pay for what they use, including fuel, vehicle maintenance, and the largest portion of the fleet budget, the end-of-life vehicle replacement. The largest general fund cost belongs to the second largest piece of the pie, street maintenance. However, their slice of the pie also includes non-general fund resources like 
uh, utility impact reimbursements from environmental utilities for their impact to our roadways, road safety funds, and some gas tax for roadway maintenance. Alternative transportation comes in with the third largest budget. Much of that pie belongs to transit-related costs, but the entire pie sli slice is funded with state sales and gas tax. They do not use any general fund. Facility maintenance and engineering tie for the smallest pieces of the pie. However, their funding sources are definitely not the same, with facilities being an ISF, Internal Service Fund, division similar to fleet. And engineering is a mix of general fund, capital improvement projects, secondary labor charges, and Roso Electric funding for signal maintenance. Administration is a small three-person team, and our budget barely shows up in the graph and includes funding from all of the previously mentioned sources. So the primary driver of budget changes in fiscal year 23 for Public Works is growth. Growth of the city leads to an increase in the number of assets to maintain and the number of calls for service. The budget is also responding to another type of growth, growth of material and contract costs due to inflation. Quickly going through the list of budget increases requested for this next year, we have a small increase in general fund for flood alert equipment repair and replacement due to material cost increases. That's $11,000. We have $145,000 of general fund for increased quantities and costs of paving materials, herbicide, and concrete materials. We have $100,000 of general fund to put more resources into remo removing graffiti quickly when it appears around the city. As Mike mentioned earlier, this uh, will likely transfer over to development services in the future, but for right now, we put it in public works. Uh, we have $20,000 in general fund to convert a part-time temporary office assistant to a part-time regular employee. Engineering has had this temporary position for over a decade, and the workload's not going away anytime soon. We have $113,000 in general fund resources to add a project coordinator to street maintenance. As we keep adding new roads, in the city, the workload continues to grow, and we're going to use this position as a force multiplier by hiring contractors to complete some of the work or regular staff just can't fit into their schedules, or that require specialized skills or equipment we currently do not have. In this way, one full-time staff person can turn into a short-term crew of 5 or 10 or 20 workers to get something done. $124,000 in electric funds to hire another traffic signal maintenance worker to help keep our ever-increasing list of traffic signals and intelligent transportation system equipment functioning. Uh, $77,000 in facility internal service funds to keep Roosevelt Electric's uh, legacy building and the soon to be constructed fire station number eight in tip top condition. Um, a little bit about that. Occasionally I bring visitors into our civic center and they ask me how old our building is. And when I tell them the new portions, the new portions of the building are 20 years old they're amazed at how new and well kept our buildings are. And that just doesn't happen without regular maintenance and cleaning. So in addition to the maintenance worker, uh, there's a $64,000 request for facilities uh, from facilities ISF for a new custodian to help keep things uh, clean and in tip-top shape. And sometimes you have to look at how the duties and responsi responsibilities of a particular position have changed over time. And at other times, you need to look at the organizational structure of a department or division to make sure the needs of the organization as a whole are being met. With the $47,000 request in fleet internal service funds being requested for a potential reclassification of the parts buyer to a managing supervisor, we are doing both. The position's responsibility has grown to what we believe may be a, at a management level, and the fleet division has grown to the point where it would greatly benefit from a third managing supervisor. And lastly, we're requesting $108,000 to add a mechanic to fleet services. As the city grows, the number of city staff and their related vehicles and equipment also increases. And this requires more mechanics to keep the city working. So in total, the budget increase request for Public Works is just over $800,000, with $390,000 of that being general fund. The rest of it is coming from other sources. And that includes my brief budget presentation and... Uh, me and my Pub Works Division managers are here to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Does the council have any questions of Jason? Just one question. On the custodian that you're asking for, would that be a city employee or are we vending that out? 
that would be a city employee. We um, hire a lot of contract employees to do uh, our work. Um, but there's some places we just feel it's more appropriate to have a city staff. The Legacy Building is one of those because it's Roseville Electric. They're dealing with money, and they also have high security being an electric utility. Wonderful. Thank you. That's a good idea. Okay. I'll open up to public comment. Is there anyone here tonight that would like to <coughs> make a comment on what we just heard? All right. We'll close public comment. Thank you so much for all the information, Jason. Next up, we have our Economic Development Director. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Bernasconi, members of the City Council, Melissa Angiano, your City's Economic Development Director. I am pleased to be here tonight to present the budget for our Economic Development Department. The Economic Development Department is comprised of two divisions, the Economic Development Division and the Housing Division, which is also serves as the Roseville Housing Authority. The Economic Development Division focuses on strengthening Roseville's position as a community of choice for business investment and lifestyle by retaining, attracting, and growing businesses, encouraging job growth and investment in the city, and leveraging local and regional partners to build on Roseville's competitive advantages. The division also provides staffing and support for the city's Economic Development Advisory Committee. The Housing Division strives to increase the city's affordable housing availability and housing options throughout the city. They do this by primarily managing a variety of programs, including our Housing Choice Voucher Rental Assistance Program, the Community Block, um, Development Block Grant, CDBG Program, Affordable Purchase and Owner Occupied Rehab Programs. The Division also provides staffing and support for the housing um, Authority, as mentioned, the Homeless Response Team, the Successor Agency, the Housing Successor Agency, and the Grants Advisory Commission. The overall operating budget for economic development is about $4.1 million. As you can see from the pie chart, a majority of this um, is included in the Housing Division but um, does include non-general funds, including CDBG, which includes the federal stimulus funds, our home funds, Cal home funds, our housing trust funds, as well as the citizen benefit fund and REACH funds. The economic development uh, component of our operating budget, which is at 13%, represents about $1.13 million. While our budget this year is primarily status quo, we are not adding any positions or any um, budgeted expenses. Um, we do have some, um, few, a few significant revenue and funding impacts that we felt were notable to, to mention um, as they continue to support council goals and priorities. Under enhancing economic vitality, um, the digital revenue from the billboards that were recently approved, uh, we will start to see some of that revenue coming in. This revenue has been budgeted, as mentioned um, by Dennis, and uh, we will adjust this in accordance with the lease terms on an annual basis. The boards are expected to be fully operational by July, and so we do expect to receive our first uh, conditional signing bonus, or our second conditional signing bonus is a $450,000 um, at the start of the fiscal year. And then thereafter, um, starting with the first year uh, rent, annual rent of $680,000 a year. Uh, we are continuing to work through the sale of three additional surplus properties. While the dates are not certain at this point, we will work on the necessary budget adjustments to the Strategic Initiative Fund as those transactions occur. That includes the Roseville Industrial Park, 505 Royer, which was recently approved um, by City Council, and 401 and 403 Oak Street, which the city is currently in an exclusive right to negotiate. And then the growth factory, which also was recently approved by City Council, uh, we will be seeing uh, work uh, revenue come in from, from that endeavor um, with approximately 16000 in annual rent for the first year. Um, our, how, we are, um, our housing um, division, which represents a significant amount of work um, in our office, and we are also looking to look at... Uh, 
leveraging an additional round of local housing trust fund with the state and uh, seeking match for a little bit over $4 million. We hope to get news on that in the fall. And as uh, council recently approved, $7.5 million in revenue, uh, in, uh, revenue reservations for three projects on our housing pipeline. We also saw a significant increase in our uh, housing uh, authority budget, just over a million dollars from last year's 6.5 million. And as you know, uh, this mainly funds all of our programs under our housing choice voucher programs, including our homeless vouchers, our VASH vouchers, our mainstream and our emergency house um, housing vouchers. Moving forward, we're excited to continue to work with council and our partners on leveraging Roseville's value propositions, the entrepreneurship and small business um, growth factory site that was just approved by council uh, last a few weeks ago um, is a great opportunity for the city to continue to leverage our support um, and activities, not only in our core, but throughout the city. We are working on an updated economic development strategy plan, which we um, are also looking at implementation and, and what that looks like for the city, including uh, workforce development, sports, tourism, and entertainment, as mentioned by our parks and recreation and libraries department, storytelling and sharing of information, looking at how we continue to support uh, solutions and programs under our utilities, uh, and then um, how we continue to also support our strategic initiative fund and other funding opportunities that help the city's uh, local economy thrive. Uh, we are excited um, and, and fortunate to have a strong business community in our city. Um, we've heard recent expansions with Penumbra, TSI, Sutter, and Kaiser. We continue to uh, look at how we can support the conditions that allow for businesses to continue to grow and add jobs to our city. Our housing department, uh, our housing division is also um, looking at creative and competitive funding opportunities. The cost of housing and the need for housing continues to increase. And so looking at where are those opportunities as a city that we can leverage and participate in. And then as uh, you can see from the map on, on the screen, uh, we have a lot of activity that's happening uh, throughout the city, but notably in the, in the, in the core downtown area um, with the um, activity around city surplus sites, the post office, 401 Oak, 505 Bridge, um, and then Mer um, affordable housing projects with Mercy, Bridge, and Hampstead. And then we also look forward to looking at how we can improve investment and uh, development along our commercial corridors with the corridor-specific plans. Any questions? Any questions of Melissa? Mm. Will you remind me again the Roseville Industrial Park? It's Where the Panatoni um, okay. site. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, anything else? Mm -hmm. So much going on. A lot. And how long yeah. have you been on the job now? A little over six months. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. I will um, open this up to public comment. Is there anyone here tonight that would like to comment on the presentation we just heard? Okay. I'll close public comment. Thank you very much. And then I will open up uh, for one pub one last public comment on any item that's not on the agenda. If anyone wanted to comment on anything this evening. Okay, I'll close public comment. Bring it back to the council. I know we have a meeting tomorrow night, our regular scheduled meeting. Any other final comments of my colleagues before we adjourn? Mayor, if, if I may just make a couple, okay. just a couple quick closing thoughts, really more more than comments. As, as you mentioned, uh, tonight's b budget presentation will come before you uh, on the fifteenth for for approval, uh, and, and I just wanted to take a second to just reflect a little bit. If these presentations didn't get you excited to be part of this team tonight, I I, I don't know what will. I don't know that I've ever been. Uh, more energized or or uh, honored to be part of part of a team. And this has been a, a four year process, uh, and, and the one thing that really stuck out to me was change, right? And and the change that was coming. And and with change is always the close companion of uncertainty. Uh, and and I think this budget really does a good job not only planning for the uncertainties today that we know and the ones we can control. 
but to the best of our abilities, the ones that are coming and that, that may impact our ability to protect our quality of life. And, and so I, I just want to thank the council for their resolve through this planning process and, and sticking to the priorities and, and staff for their hard work and the hundreds of hours that went into this budget and this process and, and just their tireless effort to, to really serve the residents of Roseville. Uh, so I, I look forward to presenting this on, on the 15th. Uh, w with Dennis and uh, again just want to thank you and thank our staff for all of their effort and work that went into this this budget so thank you thank you for that and I'll just wrap up I guess on behalf of our council by saying that we um, are fully aware of the capable um, resourceful committed um, staff that we have and we have a hundred percent confidence in all of you and we feel very um, I don't know if lucky is the right word, but very honored to work um, alongside all of you. And we, we know that this is just uh, a short sampling of the work that goes into it every single year. So we appreciate all of your efforts. Um, we appreciate the public for coming out tonight and taking part of it. And um, all this is under your leadership, Dom. So I want to acknowledge you for that. So unless my colleagues have any other final comments, uh, we will have our regularly scheduled council meeting tomorrow night 6 p.m. and I'll adjourn us till then. Thank you all for staying.